So, namaste everyone. So, yesterday uh, the session was about motion in one and two dimension. So, we introduced the concept of uh, uniform motion, non-uniform motion, velocity and acceleration. And then uh, uh, we discussed in detail about graphical representation of motion. And uh, here we are moving on to we introduced acceleration. So, uh, acceleration comes from force and we are going to learn about laws of motion, especially Newton's laws of motion. So I'm sharing my screen now. Okay. So now I'm going to, I'm not going to list the learning outcomes. Actually, I want you to tell the learning outcomes. So what are the expected learning outcomes here? What are the learning outcomes in this lesson? Can I get clues from you? Students understand the inertia. See, actually, this was, that's a learning objective. Learning outcomes are to be measurable. Learning outcomes are measurable. Can, can I measure understanding? Child is able to understand. How to measure understanding? So, uh, okay. Inertia, correct. So he'll, uh, the student will be able to define inertia. That is outcome. No, that is a measurable outcome. Okay, before that, before that, we are going to introduce them to force, isn't it? We'll give some uh, some example. I will tell you how to introduce force. So the child will be able to. Okay. So at the end of, uh, okay, I will write like this. Students will be able to define so as you define force okay inertia all this definition inertia then momentum etc all this definition then so after introducing inertia and momentum you'll be teaching them all the three laws of motion laws of motion, laws of motion. so state state newton's laws of motion okay just stating they will be able to state newton's law of motion after properly understanding the significance of laws of motion isn't it then what is what are the other learning outcomes so after stating newton's law of conservation of okay law of state law of conservation of momentum state law of conservation of Momentum. Will that will uh, will not the children apply or uh, understand uh, daily some daily life situation based on Newton's laws of motion? Day to day life. Day to day life. List the applications of or analyze analyze the applications of. Newton's laws, or they will connect. They will be able to connect the Newton's law with day-to-day -day life situations, isn't it? Newton's laws in everyday life situation. Then, so they will apply Newton's law, the law of inertia. Um, inertia has three types. So all the application of Newton's law in everyday life situation, they'll be able to explain. Then one more important qua, qua, physical quantity. Impulse. 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 They will define impulse. Thrust. Define force. Analyze the cause of force, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. Analyze the cause of friction. Sorry, cause of friction. Types of friction. Very good. Differentiate. See, these are the uh, different type of learning outcomes. Differentiate different type of frictional. Differentiate force. types of friction. Types of friction. Then discuss. Discuss the motion of objects 
under friction so they will uh, they will consider frictional force in analyzing the motion of object then list the uh, methods methods can we include uh, uh, explaining a situation on the basis of inertia yeah uh, like one question comes where uh, why we dust the carpet hit the carpet uh, for cleaning the dust yeah, yeah, so yeah. there okay. they are applying the concept apply that's what no apply newton's uh, laws yes this is newton's third law ma'am apply newton's third law in understanding rocket propulsion isn't it rowing of boat then walking even walking is because of newton's third law so these are the learning outcomes okay so you we expect these learning outcomes from the children so we have to modify our pedagogy what is a pedagogy actually what do you mean by pedagogy we have different type of pedagogy like explaining experiential learning ma'am education with solving. art ma'am ha huh? yeah, lessons teaching with art ma'am yeah lesson teaching with art so oh, teaching is a very good lesson teaching is an art so what are the different methods of learning methodology so that we get these outcomes from the children okay so now let us go to the experiential learning experiential learning so we are going to list different activities we are going to discuss different activities where through these activities we are going to bring about these learning outcomes okay so now so when you are introducing concept of force will you directly define force or will you ask basic questions so you know that in the previous lesson we already introduced acceleration so acceleration brings about change in velocity okay so now now the question is why does a ch child be you are you have discussed about the effect of no you have discussed about non uniform motion so non uniform motion means it is possible only when there is an acceleration okay so now we discussed already we have discussed the effect of force the effect of the force changes the type of motion from uniform to non uniform so only that is only the agency which changes the type of motion is only force so just ask the question why does the speed of an object change why does the speed of an object change or how does the speed of an object change simply a, a, see unless we know that force is required but i want this answer from the mouth of the children why does this immediately it will tell uh, the children will tell uh, we have to Uh, uh we suppose if you are traveling in a car we have to apply we have to change the gear or we have to accelerate so what is the cause of acceleration then definitely the child will tell the force is required uh, engine uh, drive the uh, car or because of we are accelerating we are forcing the engine to increase the speed so speed of an object change whenever force is applied Okay, next question. Do all motion require a cause? Do you think so? Do all motion require a cause? If so, what is the nature of the cause? So now, successfully, we have we not introduced force. Yes. All motion. In order to start a motion, you need to apply force. In order to stop the motion, we need to apply a force. So what is the change in the direction of? change the direction also so now you introduce a concept of force the children will tell uh, as soon as you open out uh, the word force you can easily get this answer what are the effect of the force all this answer the children will tell it it can increase speed or decrease speed it can change the direction it can change the shape start moving or stop moving because of the force so you can give several example it can change the shape can change the direction can change the speed so now give the def definition 
pulling or pushing. Usually we say force is effect of pull or push. Pulling or pushing. So you give a proper definition. They will give all the answer, combine it and put in a proper statement. It is an external effort in the form of pushing, pulling, stretching, compressing, all come under force, which may move a body at rest or stop a moving body or change the direction of a moving body or change the size and shape of a body. All these are effect of the force. So finally come to a conclusion and uh, um, uh, get a, a very good definition of the force from the children. So now they uh, now just to do this activity, try pushing the desk or a table. Um, I'm applying a force. I'm applying a force now, children. Why the uh, why uh, the table is not moving? The table is not moving. Why? We discussed that force can change the uh, can uh, make an object to move. But I'm applying a force. Why it is not moving? Immediately, what the children will tell? The force is not sufficient. Is that the answer? Is that the answer? Some other force is acting, isn't it? There is one force. There is some other force which is preventing the motion, isn't it? Not? What is that force? So, this boy is applying force. force. Floor and table. So, there is a force acting opposite to that exactly equal. That is called friction. Isn't it? The frictional force is more than the applied force. That's why though is applying force, the object is not moving. So now this is as long as, as long as this disc is not moving, the applied force is equal to the frictional force. Even if he's applying, he's increasing the magnitude of the force applied. If the disc is not moving or if the table is not moving, that means the applied force is as the applied force increases, the frictional force also increases. We know we, we know that, isn't it? Till the uh, applied force is sufficient to overcome the friction. And we call that as a maximum value of static friction, limiting friction, all that you will teach after to complete the uh, uh, laws of motion, is it not? So we draw plot a graph, FA is applied force. This is frictional force. So we say that frictional force is the what type of force? Frictional force is self-adjusting, isn't it? See, now suppose first he's applying 10 Newton, let us say, the disc is not moving. Now he is applying 100 Newton. He's applying 200 Newton. 200 Newton. Still the table is not moving. That means what? In proportion to the applied force, the frictional force is also increasing. But once he apply 250 Newton, suppose he's applying 250 Newton and the disc start moving, that means he's able to overcome the maximum friction. That maximum friction is limiting friction. After that, even um, whatever force is able to maintain the applied force, the E can push the table. He can push the table. So, you know, that maximum value of static friction is, what is that called? Limiting friction. This value is limiting friction. All that we understood. So, as long as the table is not moving, the frictional force balance the applied force. Now it's a balanced force. Now, uh, these two person, they are able to move the object. So that means it's an unbalanced force. Isn't it? Unbalanced force only can cause change in motion. Unbalanced force, as long as balanced force are acting, the F net become zero. So here, F net, F net is zero. So usually we tell about tug of war when we are teaching balanced and unbalanced force, isn't it? I do that. Do you do that? Whenever you teach balanced and unbalanced force, we introduce them or we teach them we, through this illustration. So as long as these two teams are uh, exerting equal and opposite force, uh, this uh, rope, so it will be in equilibrium. So neither side, uh, there is no extra force on either side and it will be uh, taught. Okay, it will be uh, there, won't, there won't be any uh, change in the equilibrium. So what will happen now? This team is exerting 400 Newton. So they are pulled. This team is pulled towards this team. So this team will be the winner. So which is the balanced force here? This, 
the first diagram illustrate balanced force and the second diagram illustrate unbalanced Unbalanced. force unbalanced force keep on interacting teachers so we are only it is only i have been telling you it's collaborative learning if you have any other method also you can share do you have any other example to illustrate balanced and unbalanced force i can also learn from you so now you define balanced force if the resultant of all the forces acting on a body is zero forces are acting but resultant of all the forces acting on a body is zero the forces are called balanced force please write the definition boldly on the blackboard so that the students can take it should be very legible your blackboard writing should be very legible and make the students write write the definition on their classwork don't ever give printed notes or notes they have to develop the habit of taking class notes we do that isn't it yes, yes unbalanced yes thank you anuja for interacting i want other participant also to be very very interacting so that it is a it is not that i am teaching and you are listening you are all very uh, uh, experienced teachers and we learn from each other unbalanced forces if the resultant of all the forces acting on a body is not zero forces are called unbalanced force so what is the effect of unbalanced force what is the effect of unbalanced force object can move object can increase the speed of the object can increase yes. the motion may start is it it yes yes ma'am yes now slowly move on to uh, we are going to introduce newton's first law now before newton's first law what is that physical quantity will introduce inertia Inertia. inertia inertia so if an object is at rest it will stay at rest so you keep a ball on your table and then uh, you can explain that it is going to be at rest forever unless you apply a force and you roll the ball if an object is in motion it will stay in motion unless a net force act on it will the children agree for it immediately they will tell immediately see what after some time the ball will stop isn't it yes but according to your statement the ball should roll on forever So the child, children will ask, "Ma'am, the ball has stopped. You told me that uh, the ball will roll forever. It has stopped. What answer will you give?" Because of friction, it's uh... ah external force because of friction. So you will you will write the you will give the next statement, isn't it? Unless it is acted upon by external unbalanced force. This is incomplete. Whatever uh, uh, statement I have written, no. If an object is in motion, will stay in motion unless it yeah unless it net force acting on it. Net force is acting on it. Yes. So they, then he will ask, what is a net force, ma'am? We have not exerted any force. Which force is stopping the ball? So you will tell frictional, frictional force It's because frictional. of the frictional external force is friction. Of course, you have to introduce friction. So now uh, through this activity, what? Okay, what can you uh, define or what can you illustrate what can you illustrate through this activity carrom coin immediately the student will connect if you tell some uh, game if you associate any game so when uh, when you are arranging a pile of coin and if you use a striker to strike the coin you can see that only one coin comes out all the other coin will be will not uh, move from their place is it of course you yeah, should know the knack of it you should know the knack of it so you are applying force only due to inertia of rest all the other coins have a tendency to be at rest the force is applied only at the bottom most coin so all the other coin remain stable so what is this inertia of coin huh inertia of rest ma'am inertia of rest so the here uh, the moving bus or whatever vehicle uh, she is traveling come to rest brakes are applied so when brakes are applied we tend to move in the backward direction isn't it yes so the but uh, but uh, the passenger uh, are in the state I of i believe we move forward like we will be continuing no, no, in the motion of the bus so No, no. This is uh, this is uh, yeah. This is in a uh, stationary bus starting. Upper nice correct. Okay. Stationary bus. Okay. Acceleration is applied and it is a, a bus is starting. When a bus is starting, okay, 
acceleration in the forward direction, but the passenger are in a state of rest. So they fall backward. When a stationary bus start, Apana, you're very alert. Thank you for that. Thank you, ma'am. <laughs> okay. Now, the bus moves suddenly, the passenger jet backward, isn't it? So you should give lots of illustration before you introduce inertia of rest or inertia of motion. And you can give the importance of wearing seat belt now. Okay, safety measure. Why seat belts are worn? Why seat belts are worn? Certain brake is applied means we will go forward because of yeah. inertia, motion. inertia of motion. Very good. When a sudden brake is applied, we have a tendency to fall forward because our body is in state of motion. So even though the bus stops, our body has a tendency to move forward. So immediately if the belt is not worn, we will dash against the steering and we'll get, isn't it? Mostly the, if you see the photograph of the, the photograph of the accident scene, the driver would have fallen towards the steering wheel, isn't it? Yes, that's important. You can stress upon the importance of the, uh, the seat belt. Now see, this is a funny video where body uh, because of this wall the bike comes to a stop but this one this boy you know this boy is thrown off because of inertia of what type of inertia inertia of motion give lots of illustration give lots of illustration so experiential learning just uh, show this figure and ask them whether this is due to inertia of rest or motion inertia of rest, inertia of rest. yes crazy ma'am thank you <laughs> you're also very interactive and it's a beautiful diagram, isn't it? It's the importance of tying the, uh, what is that? Inertia of motion. Cargo. All the suitcases, no? When they take all the items uh, on a moving uh, uh, car or a uh, heavy vehicle, we, they do have it has to be tied properly. Otherwise, see the object due to a sudden break. This is the same way. Uh, sudden break would have been applied and the whatever item which is kept inside is dashing against the front portion of the wheel. This is also uh, due to... Yes. Uh, can we also give the example like if in a moving bus or train when we open a water bottle or a cup, the water will still be because it will uh, when the brakes are suddenly applied. Mm, so we, sh will. we should wait till it stops. Yes, yes. Good, good. Yes, yes. And uh, this one is due to it's some circular motion. Ma Suppose uh, you uh, you can do this activity due uh, activity to illustrate inertia of direction. direction. Have a stone and uh, tie a thread and then whirl it and then leave the uh, leave your uh, finger suddenly. The string is released. No, if you release this uh, string from your hand, you can see that it it will fly off tangentially. At this point, you are le leaving. You can see that it is. It will leave tangentially. Okay, why tangentially? It's of direction, ma'am. Yeah, for a circular motion, the instantaneous direction is direction, direction. of tangent you're drawing, isn't it? That's why I, you can also give some other uh, illustration to understand uh, inertia of direction. What is that? Familiar example, during rainy season, have you observed the tires of the wheel? How the water gushes out of the wheel, it will be gushing out tangentially, isn't it? Tangentially. That's why mud guards are provided. What the is the application of mud guards? Example. There is a, uh, yeah, there is a, a rectangular sheet, no? So it will prevent water from splashing because the water which is splashing from the uh, tire, no? It will be prevented uh, from splashing uh, if you have a mud guard. So last year when I took online class, no? Uh, immediately one child uh, took a video of this. She did this experiment. Somebody, her sister videographed it and she showed the same photograph. This is a picture. She illustrated. She took a video and sent to me. I was very happy. I, uh, it made me really, I was thrilled to uh, see the enthusiasm in children. So when you do so many activities, no, when you uh, when you interact with the children or when uh, when you take the lesson so interestingly, students will be really motivated. They will send you a lot of activity. 
and uh, you know that the idea of inertia uh, first uh, it was thought only by galileo so he made that uh, interesting um, this you have to share with your children so he made several experiments with inclined plane you know that suppose you have an inclined plane like this and the ball which is falling from this height will try to reach the same height will try to reach the same height you know you know if there is no friction so it's because uh, it's losing its uh, uh, potential energy and it is gaining kinetic energy so it uh, it will uh, travel a distance in order to reach the same height isn't it this height so this height actually this height must be say it, it should be should be come okay so um, what he did he just uh, initially the height of the two inclined were same had the inclination were same and gradually it flattened the other uh, this portion of the inclined and he observed that in order to in order that it reached the same height it travel a longer distance you know that this distance if you take this distance is more suppose uh, so as the inclination as the inclination uh, is changed the distance okay the distance travel by by the ball went on increasing so what will happen if the if this portion became flat this portion became flat this portion becomes flat the ball will travel on and on and on continuously it will travel in order to reach the same height isn't it so now it has some energy it's falling down now if you neglect friction in order to so what is the tendency of the ball why as it increase as it decrease the inclination as this becoming closer to the ground the length of the ball the length or the distance traveled by the ball go on increase in order to reach the get the same height in order to reach to the same height suppose if this region become flat the ball will continue to move isn't it continue to move forever in order to reach the same height it is not going to find the another incline isn't it so it has to travel forever that is only flat, uh, yes it becomes flat it will become sorry this one become flat the surface is becoming flat so um in the absence of some kind of force an object would keep moving forever once it got started so once it got started i have started the motion so now in order to continue so in order to stop it i need to apply some force isn't it so this experiment only lead to led to the idea of inertia previously aristotle thought that natural state of object was to be at rest if you got them moving eventually they would come to rest again but being at rest is the relative so aristotle Uh, according to whatever observation we observe that moving object come to a stop he said it's the property of the matter to come to rest it's not so it's not the property of matter it will come it will not come to rest at all if if, you, if there is no friction if there is no friction the ball will roll forever if you uh, go to space where there is no friction and if the surface is very very smooth it will never stop it will never stop that was the idea instilled by started the idea started with galileo and newton modified and stated as and he stated the stated the first law so so now we know that uh, for uh, then, then ask the children to conclude so children now you know that an object at rest remain at rest an object in motion will continue moving unless it is acted upon by an unbalanced force now the children will come beautifully with the statement of newton's first law so this activity i think it it illustrate how many of you have done this activity yeah thank you grace very good ma'am me also ma'am yes thank you thank you please do this activity this may appear very simple see these experiments you are very familiar but for the children it is they are they are uh, viewing it for the first time see now they see before starting of the experiment you just explain it i am going to give it uh, disturb the cart what will happen to the coin so children usually will tell that both the coin the coin will move along with the cart but they never they will uh, they don't uh, expect that the coin will fall and the cardboard will fly away the coin is exactly 
the coin is exactly in its position. It is maintaining its position. That is why it is falling inside the tumbler. Okay, it's a very funny video. It illustrates what? Inertia of motion. Inertia of motion. Okay. And after Newton first law, please ask um, all this question. So when a horse suddenly starts running, the rider falls backward. Is it not? The rider starts falling backward. It's due to inertia of rest. And this experiment you can do. Dust is removed from a hanging carpet by beating it with a stick. That's what Aparna said, isn't it? This one beautifully you can illustrate. Just uh, um, beat the beat the carpet or beat your duster. I used to beat the duster. You have a duster? No, I used to beat the duster. Okay, the dust the duster will uh, the duster will move. The uh, dust particle will remain in the same position and they get separated from the duster. So when we shake the branch of a tree, its fruit and dry leaves fall down. That's also due to inertia of rest. So all the illustration, whatever is possible, either get from the children or you discuss. Just tell the situation, ask them to explain based on whatever law which is applicable. An athlete runs for a certain distance before taking a long jump. The children would have observed it or when they are running also immediately they will not have a, when they are doing long jump, they have to run for a longer distance. Similarly, uh, an um, aeroplane Get taking off. From the moving bus. Aeroplane taking off. Yeah. Moving bus. Getting down of a moving getting bus. Getting down from moving. To the moving bus. Getting, uh, after getting down of a moving bus, the person will run for some distance. Because his body is in the state of motion, he will continue to be in the state of motion so that it doesn't fall. Immediately, if he stop now, his body will be, the front portion of the body will be in motion. The foot would have come to rest. That will cause an equilibrium uh, imbalance. So, definitely, he will fall. So, if he is experienced in uh, running, getting down from the moving After bus. After catch the ball also, bowlers also moving the hand in uh, the direction bowlers. of the ball. Yes, yes, yes. Even the, uh, no, no, after catching the ball. Yes, ma'am. After catching, catching the, the ball, they ball. will move along the, for some distance. A ball thrown upward in a moving train comes back to its thrower's hand. Isn't it? You just do this, ask the children to do the experiment. When the train is moving, ask them to throw some ball. The ball will come back to the person hand because the ball is also moving with the train. The ball is also moving with the train. The boy is also moving with the train. So, the ball thrown upward in a moving train comes back to the thrower hand. Now, you are going to introduce. So, now we have, we have, uh, we have we had given enough illustration to make them understand Newton's first law. Yes. So now we are going to introduce them to concept of momentum in order that they understand Newton's second law. So when you define momentum, just ask them. So the body is in motion. Okay. So what do you think the factor on which motion of a body depends? Does it depend only on the velocity? How will you make them understand that the motion of a body depends on mass as well as velocity? How will you make them understand? A feather, then a, a ball or a stone. Really, mm -hmm. you know, because there is mass. Okay. So, when you are uh, catching a, a cricket ball, when you're catching a cricket ball, your hand hurts. You feel that heaviness of the ball. Cricket ball, which is coming with a high speed. And uh, imagine that uh, the same speed you are catching a tennis ball. Tennis, bo ten uh, tennis ball is a little lighter. Isn't it? So, you can feel the motion. The motion depends on mass, not only with velocity. And then whenever uh, uh, a cycle hit you, you are you are not uh, getting uh, that much damage. A person is hit by a cycle. Whereas if a person is hit by a car or a heavy vehicle, the damage will be immense. Isn't it? Though both of them are moving with the same velocity. Imagine that a cycle and a 
a lorry, both of them are moving with the same velocity. And suppose if a person is uh, uh, hit by cycle or uh, corresponding uh, same velo uh, same uh, vehicle, uh, heavy vehicle moving at the same velocity, ask them to imagine which will cause greater damage to the person. Definitely, a heavy vehicle will cause greater damage because the momentum not only depends on velocity, it also depends on the uh, mass. 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 So now, you know that a force produces change in the velocity. So, force will produce change in the momentum because momentum depends on the velocity. Now, introduce a concept of second law. The rate of, we talk about, uh, now, see, first law tell us what are the effect of the force. Second law, define the force, how to measure force. Second law, tell us how to measure force. So, second law of motion state that the rate of change of momentum of an object is proportional to the applied unbalanced force. And the change of momentum, there are two parts of the law. First, what happens when an applied force? What, what is the effect of the unbalanced force? There is a change in momentum. And the change in momentum is along the direction of the force. So now, based on this, you know, so whenever you are doing a derivation, it's a very small derivation. This, see, don't ever assume that all these points we are discussing in ninth standard, isn't it? We do, children do learn all this in ninth standard, but when they come to 11th standard, straight away, don't uh, go to law of conservation momentum. Assuming that they all, all of them know all this concept. No, again, you have to start from the, or from known to unknown. Check whether they all, they know all these ideas. Otherwise, you cannot travel towards higher concept in law of conservation of momentum. Okay. So, whenever you do the derivation part, you have to uh, correctly define what are the physical quantities you are introducing. Write them on the board. If u is the initial velocity, v is the final velocity, f is the force applied, m is the mass of the object, p1 is the initial momentum, p2 is the final momentum. And in order that this momentum change, time taken for the change in momentum is T. So what is the change in momentum? Change in momentum is this. This change in momentum takes place in a small interval of time T. So what is rate of change of momentum? So rate of change of momentum immediately will get an expression as MA. So then bring about Newton's second law. So F is proportional to MA, F is equal to KMA. So what is that K? K is a constant. 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 So we choose it to be one unit. Here we are choosing conveniently, we choose the unit. So one uh, M is one kg, A is one meter per second square, then K is equal to one. So F is equal to MA. So, and then you have to define uh, SI unit of force. Okay, SI unit of force is one Newton. Okay, so what is one Newton? Okay. Now, we introduce a concept of impulse. So, what do you mean by impulse? We say a person is very impulsive, no? One who reacts to a situation. Very yeah, ma'am. Larger force acting on small interval of time, ma'am. Very good, very good. Larger force acting for a short interval of time. That is only impulse. Okay. Force... Some example you can give, force exert, you can directly go to some illustration. Usually I give this impulse. This karate uh, master is hitting the ice, I can say ice uh, bricks. Okay. So the impact is, is doing it very fast. You must have seen the a karate player in action. They will do it very fast. So very fast. So what happens when the see here he's hitting the ice? So large force. How do you measure the force? Force is measured as change in momentum. Change in momentum. Change in momentum. Change in momentum divided by time. Time. 
or f is equal to m b minus n mu by t. So now this change of momentum from a very small momentum. So he is hitting when he is sitting. He is bringing a large change of momentum in a very short time. So when time interval of the change, the change takes place in a very short time. What happens to the force of impact? The force of impact is very very large. That's why he is able to break the uh, break. Uh, uh, what, uh, what is that? Bricks. He is able to break the bricks. He is able to break large slab of ice because the force become enormous because of the fast action. The time of if the time reduces, the time of impact is reducing. F become larger. So there are two cases where I can the impulse is actually measured by the product of impulse is nothing but change in momentum. It is a product of force and time. It is a product of force and time. So impulse is the total effect of a large force. Somebody told me, I think Jagannathan sir, isn't it? Impulse is a total effect of a large force which act for a short time to produce finer change in momentum. So impulse is force into time or total change in momentum. So F T, you know that F into T is change in momentum. So the unit of impulse and momentum will be the same. So when you, whenever you are uh, teaching impulse, no. You define impulse, but give lots of illustration. So why does the cricket player lower his hand while catching a ball? Why does he lower his hand? Time. So, so now, uh, yes. The ball is coming with a high momentum, no? So if he may immediately, if he catches to extend the time. To extend the time, very good. To extend the time. To extend the time so that force of impact on his ball is reduced. Suddenly, if he's catching now, what will be his reaction? It will be reaction is he will oh. feel hurt. The, 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 your, his hand is going to hurt very badly and he may even lose the catch. Isn't it? So he is extending, he is moving it backward. He is moving his hand backward so that it takes time for the change momentum. Now the momentum is going to become zero as soon as he catches the ball. So he is delaying that process. He is delaying the process of momentum to become zero. So he is increasing the time. When he is increasing the time, what happens? The force of impact getting reduced. Ma'am, uh, we can also uh, consider the example of uh, hitting a nail. Like if we want to ah. hammer a nail, if we do yes. it very slowly, it won't go inside. We need to do it very quickly. Very fast. Yeah, that is a very good example where when you are hitting a nail, when you want to fix a nail on the wall, you have to hit a little hard, harder and fast because the force of impact, you want the force of impact to be very large. So whenever you want to increase the uh, force, reduce this time. When if you want to increase the force, time of impact has to be reduced. When you want to decrease the force, time of impact has to be increased. So the impulse depends on both F and T. Here I'm increasing the time of impact. Here also, see here, you must have seen uh, sand bed, isn't it? For a long gym, you know that even in your school, they will provide the sand bed. Sand will be filled here, fine coarse sand. Why? For a long gym. Otherwise, you will be badly hurt, no? So when he is falling on a sand bed, the sand yields. So he takes some time for the velocity. But he is he's falling, falling on the ground with very high momentum. So if the sand is not yielding, if he's falling on a concrete floor, immediately, as soon as he falls, his momentum becomes zero. So there, the time. So F becomes larger because the change in momentum occur in a short time. T become reduces force of impact on him will be very high. He may even fracture his thigh or leg. So the sand bed heal, yields to his body. He goes inside the sand. So it takes the time of time or the momentum to get zero, to get to the value of zero increases, reducing the force of impact. You have to explain to the child 
all this. And see here, you are, you are uh, um, this is an impulsive force. In, only because of the impulsive force that damage during accident is very large because the, the change in momentum, the car is traveling with some change, the change in momentum, the immediately the momentum becomes zero. If this happens in a short time, F becomes very large. The damage created will be very, very large because here the change in momentum, momentum becomes zero. When in the whenever accident occurs, the momentum suddenly it's suddenly crashing against a wall. Change in momentum occurs in a very short time. So F become very, very large. That's why the car gets crushed. So all this example, like uh, uh, you can see that the China wares, why China wares are packed in uh, cotton wool or uh, some packing is done no, with the uh, thermocol packing or cotton uh, wool packing because any impact, any sudden break, okay? So the vehicle come to a stop suddenly, what will happen? There is a huge change in momentum. There is a huge change in momentum. There is a huge impact due to that. So if the time, time is delayed. So the impact take longer time to reach the glass, glass vessels there because it has to travel through the straw, straws. So the time of impact, time of change in momentum, time for the change in momentum increases, reducing the force of impact. Please discuss many, many uh, uh, questions. Automobiles are provided with shockers. Cushions, cushion seats are provided. The shockers increase the time of jerk and hence reduce the force. This makes journey comfortable. And buffers are provided between the bogies of a train during shunting. During shunting, buffers are provided. China wires are packed in straw paper before packing. Airbags, crumbled zone, buffer barrel around bridge pylons. All these are the effect of uh, impulse momentum. Sorry, no, effect of uh, reducing the impulse or effect of the force. I, I, either I can increase the effect of the force or I can decrease the effect of the force by all this. By increasing the time interval for the change of momentum or decreasing the time interval accordingly. So now we can derive um, first law. First law can be derived from the second law. How? How to get first law from the second law? So what is Ft here? Mv minus Mu, isn't it? What happens when force is zero? Mv minus Mu is equal to zero. That means what? V is equal to U. Initial velocity is equal to final velocity. So when F is equal to zero, what is change in momentum? By T is equal to zero. So M into V minus U is equal to zero. V minus U is equal to zero means what? V is equal to U. So when F is equal to zero, V is equal to U means what? That's only first law. A body remains the same state. There is no external force. The body will continue to rest or motion. Then it so will continue to be rest or in the same state of motion. The state of motion is not affected. They continue to move with the same speed if there is no external force. So bring about all this derivations, some twist in the story. So they will get the concept very clear. So now we come to um, third law. So usually we do this balloon experiment, isn't it? They inflate the balloon, invert it. And as the, as the air gushes in the downward direction, immediately the ball will rise. Aparna, you must have done this experiment, isn't it? Uh, yes, ma'am. Yes. So action, for every action, there is equal and opposite reaction. Reaction. Yes. Now we can introduce the three body diagram. See, ask the children, just keep a book on the table. Just ask the children, is there any force acting? What the children will tell? 
no, they no. will not tell about no. reaction at all. We have not under no. They will tell that no force. But you know, uh, you must have taught them about gravitational force. So we just it, uh, keep the book here. Let it hang. Ask them. Uh, just drop an object. So what is the difference between here also weight is acting? The body is falling down. And when I keep it on the book, why the body is not falling down? Sit it. You just hang the book freely and allow it to fall. The ball will fall down. But what is it? It's the same book when it is kept on the table. Why it is not falling down? The child, children will be clueless. No. You have not introduced Newton's third law at all. So the same book, the same book when it is outside the table, it is falling down. Because you are telling weight, uh, g and all, they know, isn't it? G, g, there is an acceleration. So the acceleration is acting. Just uh, ask the children, when I'm keeping on the table, when I'm keeping the same book on the table, is that book not acted upon by G? G is... Yes. But some other force is acting, isn't it? Some other force is balancing the weight. So the book is exerting weight on the table. The book, book is exerting a force which is equal, equal to W on the table. The table in turn exert a force that only call, we call it as normal reaction. What is that? Normal. Why normal? It is perpendicular force. It is perpendicular to the surface. Normal force. So it is in accordance with Newton's third law. So now you understand children. For every action, there is equal and opposite reaction. Otherwise, the, the book wouldn't be in equilibrium. It is in equilibrium. It is in equilibrium because it is under the action of two equal and opposite forces. Okay, so in nature, whenever a force is applied, there is always a reaction force. So we can now explain the action of rocket. And now uh, you are going to uh, explain to them walking. So you will give several illustrations. No, I am not going to go in detail about that because I want to I want to discuss some problem in loss of motion. Okay, all these things I want to solve problem with three body diagram. I want to discuss. So now already in a, yes yes sir. Can I continue? Yes. yes. So now walking, how do you account for walking uh, with uh, Newton's third law? In resolution already you must have taught them in vectors. Already vectors is done. Isn't it? Vectors, resolution of vector, all this are done. So when you are walking, you know, you have to uh, we are exerting a force. We are pushing the, pushing the ground in the backward direction. Actually, we are pushing it we are applying force in this direction. Okay. The ground in turn exact, ex exert a reaction. So this is this is what we are applying. Applied force. We are pushing the ground in the backward direction. The ground exert a reaction force. This reaction force can be resolved along horizontal and vertical. The vertical force balance our weight. So our weight to be balanced down. No. So when we are standing, when we are standing without walking, Mg is Mg is vertically down. The reaction exerted by the ground on me is vertically up. Now there is no force. Now I have to apply force in order that I walk. No. So I am pushing the ground. I am applying some force. So the ground in turn exert equal force. This force has two components. R cos theta, R sin theta. R sin theta is a force I apply to walk. Component of the force. One component balance the weight. So we are bringing in two concepts here. One is Newton's third law as well as resolution law. Now, so now normal weight. So lift is stationary. So whenever lift is, lift is, lift is accelerated in the downward direction. When you are moving from 10th floor to the ground floor, you feel lighter. Huh? You feel some discomfort, no? You feel as if you are lighter. So whenever you travel in a multi-story building, 
where from 10th floor, if the lift is accelerating down, you can really feel it. And uh, if you are standing on a weighing machine, definitely your weight will be less. And uh, when the lift is moving, accelerate upward, you will feel heavy. And the weighing machine will give zero. Suppose if the cable is cut, the table is cut, it's under free fall. Under free fall, weight will be zero. Why under free fall, weight is zero, weightlessness? Why under free fall, we feel weightless? What is our weight? What is our weight? Uh, Only when we are able to, uh, yes. Mass center. NG. So, so when, when uh, suppose as long as we are standing on a surface, okay, MG, we feel this reaction exerted by the ground on us. Suppose if the surface suddenly disappear, suddenly disappear. So we can we exert MG? Can we exert MG? So MG is not exerted, so there is no reaction. So whenever there is no surface for us to exert that MG, there is no reaction. That condition is only weightlessness. Not that G vanishes. There is no surface on which we can exert force. So only when we get exert force, Newton's third law is applicable only when you are exerting force. There will be equal and opposite reaction. So there is no absence of reaction. So when there is no reaction, I don't feel my weight. So that is only weightlessness. So freely falling body is in a state of weightlessness because there is no reaction. The body is not able to exert force on any surface. So that is only condition for weightlessness. Now one question I have for the participants here. Yeah, ma'am was talking about free fall, right? And uh, generally astronauts feel weightless. You, you have seen uh, space uh, things where astronauts are seen floating. Why do you think they are floating? There is no gravitational force acting on them. Uh, the idea is, the general idea given to us is there is no gravity there, so they are floating. But actually that is not true. Because all of our space stations or space vehicles are all still under gravity. They are all still under gravity. They are under the influence of the gravitational field. Then what makes them float? And we have learned in our gravitation chapter that definitely gravity decreases with height. Right? But then it is not ceasing to act. At such a large distance, the gravity is a micro gravity, so very, very, very small value. Let that be still gravity does exist, but then what makes them float this? As Ma'am was saying, see, he they are in a space station, right? Is according to physics, is that space station an object which is experiencing that gravitational force? And also the person, the astronaut inside the space station is also an object experiencing the same acceleration due to gravity. Why? Because the acceleration due to gravity is not dependent on the mass of the object. Will you agree? We have learned this as far as back in ninth standard. Acceleration due to gravity does not depend on the mass of the object. It depends only on the mass of the planet which is exerting that force. So the weightlessness, small idea here, the weightlessness is not due to no gravity existing there. There is gravity called microgravity. It's very, very small, I agree. But then what makes them really both the space station as well as the astronaut are experiencing the same acceleration. And as ma'am was telling, there is no action and reaction pair there. And that is why you see them floating. Spaceship is in a state of free fall. Free fall. Both spaceship as well as the astronaut are in a state of free fall, experiencing the same gravitational acceleration. So they don't exert an action and reaction pair on each other. And that is why they are not, they are actually floating. 
so the idea is generally the wrong idea that we always get is the astronauts are floating because there is no gravity no there is gravity they are floating because they are under free fall thank you ma'am yeah so now i am going to discuss uh, different situation inside the lift why does the weight decreases when the lift is accelerating downwards when it is accelerating upward the apparent weight is more than the actual weight compared to the situation when the lift is stationary all that before that i want to do this problem a person of mass 60 kg is inside a lift of a mass 940 kg and presses the button on the control panel the lift starts moving upward with an acceleration of 1 meter per second square if g is 10 meter per second square then find the tension in the supporting cable so let me draw the first uh, yesterday we discussed we have to draw a diagram wherever is required okay now there is a person inside the lift so person mass is 60 kg so all all the detail please write mass of the person is 60 kg and mass of the lift is 940 kg and acceleration is 1 meter per second square 1 meter per second square upwards that also you write and g is 10 meter per second square you have to find out tension so it is tied you know lift is tied so there is a tension in the upward direction the acceleration is 1 meter per second square and there is force is it what is the force here what is the weight weight of the person plus weight of the lift 940 plus 60 into g so total mass will be 1000 mt will be 1000 kg so the weight is mg which is 1000 into 10 newton okay so now always you better write f net you know the formula f net you have to write f net is equal to net force acting on it is ma so what is the net force acting m into a okay and it arises due to two forces one is the tension t another is mg but the net acceleration on the lift is 1 meter per second square so ma is equal to what left hand side can you tell me what is ma so the net force net upward force must be more than the net downward force which gives the net force to be in the upward direction so what will i write on the left hand side what will i write tension tension then there is one downward force no t minus mg ma'am very good t minus mg t minus mg okay so t minus mg is 10000 and m what is the mass of the lift and the person 1000 into 1 so tension is 110000 Okay. Now let us consider a case when the lift is moving in the downward direction. Same problem. When the lift is moving in the downward direction with acceleration of one meter per second square, what will be the tension now? What will be the tension? Yes. There is a net downward force. What is the net force here? Again, it is only thousand into one. But on my left hand side will be what? What will be my left hand side? There is a net downward force. The downward force is more than the tension, na? So here it will be. T yes. plus mg, ma'am. T plus. T plus y. There is a net downward force. Net yeah, force is this much. So net force is subtracted here, no? Downward force minus upward force. So mg minus t. T. Yeah. Mg minus t. So what is mg? Mg is ten thousand minus thousand is equal to t. So t will be 
9000 tension will be 9000 newton okay so we discussed two cases so what is it can, can i have some general expression for t t will be m into g plus a then it when the lift is moving in the upward direction and t will be t will be t is m into g plus a if the lift is moving in the upward direction with some acceleration t is equal to m into g minus a if the lift is moving in the downward direction so suppose if the cord of the lift is cut up, what will happen to the tension what will be a in that case it's a free fall now isn't it so what will be the value of a it is going to fall freely so when the object is falling freely what is acceleration uh, g is equal to a c anna yes ma'am c so when the lift is falling freely a becomes c so what will be the tension m into g minus g so t is equal to zero tension is so we have discussed all the cases isn't it so first uh, do see before conclusion no so don't do, don't give the answer now t is equal to m into g plus a when the lift is moving in the upward direction accelerating upward direction don't give the result do some problem arrive at the result and then you can discuss because when they are going when they are writing competitive examination every time they can't be doing the problem to thinking so they need a shortcut method so you can give a formula after discussing a particular problem analyzing it uh, come to a logical conclusion and then give the uh, different situation formula okay so now um two blocks one 4 kg and another 3 kg are resting on a frictionless flow so we are not going to consider friction just touching each other and a force of 10 newton acts on the 3 kg block and 3 newton acts on the 4 kg block as shown find the magnitude of the force exerted by 3 kg block on a 4 kg block so first so which direction the acceleration will be the acceleration is always uh, can a participant mute your mic please a okay so now uh, whenever you are doing such type of problem you just uh, try to uh, mention or uh, uh, represent forces acting on each body separately so take 3 kg block separately and 4 kg block separate and try to represent all the forces acting so what are the forces acting on the 3 kg block definitely its weight so if you take g as 10 g is equal to 10 meter per second square what will be the weight 30 newton of course 3 kg is not having any vertical since as long as it's resting vertical forces are balanced so this will be a normal reaction in one so n1 is equal and opposite to 30 newton so there is no vertical force similarly for this two the normal reaction and the weight this is 40 newton n2 so both are equal and opposite so there is no vertical force okay so now the force exerted force of 10 newton acts on the 3 kg block so here it is 3 newton this also will represent and 10 newton this also will represent along with that it's given that um so you have to find out what is the force exert magnitude of the force exerted by 3 kg block on 4 kg block so now let us so there is a force they are touching each other if i uh, write this small n to be the force exerted on 3 kg block and this will be the same force n isn't it these two forces are equal and opposite force 
what is n here the force exerted on 3 kg by 4 kg and this n again so uh, action reaction pair this is what we have to find out is it clear so now we have, i have represented all the forces acting on these two blocks normal force weight uh, applied force and th between 3 kg and 4 kg they are touching each other and uh, that force only the force exerted by one block on the other that action reaction force that only we are going to calculate okay so now what is the net force here net force on 3 kg what is the net force on 3 kg start with the net force always what is the net force on 3 kg if i know the acceleration what is the force on 3 kg if a is acceleration f is equal to ma no so right f is equal to ma that's all 3a right 3a okay so i'm not going to worry about the vertical force n1 is equal to 30 newton that is not asked n2 is equal to 40 newton they are equal and opposite there is no motion on the vertical side so now if you consider 3 kg block it is the net force on it it is going to have acceleration a in this direction 4 kg or acceleration is also a they are they are connected they will move with a they will move with a common acceleration so what will be a tell me so there are two horizontal forces 10 newton towards right and n is the force towards left so what will be the and the net forces on the right hand side so what will i write can i write this as 10 minus n can i so 10 minus n is 3a so now taking this as a clue can you give equation for 4 kg block 4 kg block what is the equation for the 4 kg block the net force what is the net force on 4 kg n minus 3n very good n minus 3 n minus 3 so now what should i do now add the two add the two equation if i add the two equation this n will go off 7 is equal to 7a so a is equal to 1 meter per second square i got the that's not the answer though no? that's not uh, asked what should i find out what should i find out i should find out n so now i can easily find out n 10 minus n is 3 so n is equal to 10 minus 3 that is 7 newton okay so now once you represent by a free body diagram so this is called free body diagram fbd so you have to separately deal with the bodies given in the diagram represent all the forces and you know the net force in which direction is acting net acceleration which direction so you have to solve so draw the free body diagram where represent acceleration for each body okay write f net as ma f net is ma so this ma is due to what are the forces acting so the forces acting are 10 newton and n so apply the correct sign then get the expression any doubt in this yes sir okay so you can try i'm going to give this as a this is homework assignment for you will you do it yes ma'am this problem So usually we do all this problem, isn't it? Connected motion, pulley problem. You are familiar with this, isn't it? So what is the characteristic of connected motion? They will move with a common acceleration. When two bodies are connected, they are going to move with a common acceleration. And tension here also, it's a single rope, rope connecting the two, two bodies. So even the tension will be the same. Okay. And then you have to apply again 
uh, if I write the equation of this connected motion for uh, the mass is small m and capital M. So capital M is heavier. Okay. So the net acceleration will be in the downward direction here. And for this, this is going to move upward and this is going to move in the downward direction. So the net force, always write the net force, net acceleration in the downward direction. Capital M into A will be, it's moving in the downward direction, mg minus t. And here it is going in the upward direction. So here it is t minus mg, t minus mg. So you have to solve this two equation and get the expression for acceleration. So if it is a number problem, no uh, need to write it as m into a or use the formula. You can directly solve equation and get the answer. So two masses, 3m and m are connected by a rope and the rope passes over a pulley the rope and pulley are massless. So a previous problem, usually the NCRT problem, we calculate what? We calculate the tension and the acceleration. Here, you are supposed to find out this tension. Okay, mass of the, this is 3M and M. Find the tension T in the rope holding the T. So now what we can do, we'll construct the equations. This is 3m. This is m. So definitely this is going to be the acceleration here. And we are supposed to find out this tension. So tension always you should draw like this. Tension act on either side. This is mg and this is 3mg. So usual method, we can solve this equation because m I know the m is 2 kg here. So a here. So this heavier mass will move down. Lighter mass is going to move upward. So if I write the equation for this 3m. So 3m is moving in the downward direction. So 3mg minus T1 is equal to the net force. Actually, I should have written this 3ma. For 2ma, ma, mass m, mass m is moving in the upward direction. So it should be T1 minus mg. So I'm going to add this two equation. When I add, I get 2mg is equal to... Um, 4MA. 4 4 MA. Very good. 4MA. So A, I'm getting it as what? A will be G by 2. So if I substitute uh, T1 is MG by 2 plus MG. So M is 2 kg. So it is 3 by 2 G. 3m by 2. Uh, am I correct? T1 is ma plus yeah. mg. ma plus mg, isn't it? 3mg. Right. 3mg. T1 3MG. is 3mg. Sorry. mg plus T1 is mg plus mg plus mg M A. M G is 2 2 into 10 plus M M is uh, 2 into 5 is it so it is 30 so t1 is 30 here so this t here t and this t1 and it is in equilibrium isn't it this system is in equilibrium that means t1 and t1 must be equal to 2 T1, 30 Newton here, 30 Newton here, in the downward direction must be equal to T. So what will be T? 30 Newton force acting here and 30 Newton force acting in the downward direction to balance the T here. 
So what should be this capital T? Huh? It should be. See, it is in equilibrium. The system is in equilibrium. T1 and T1 must be T1 plus T1 must be equal to T. So T must be equal to 60 Newton. T is equal to 60 Newton. So slightly it is, uh, uh, usually we find out what is T acceleration. Nothing wrong in finding the tension. So now this pulley is fixed pulley here. The pulley is, uh, of course, the system is rope connecting the two masses and the rope is passing over a pulley. All this we discussed. Only difference is we have to find out what is the tension here in this part, in this part, this rod, in this rod. This rod is holding the entire system. What is the tension here? That will be T1 plus T1. Here. 